Thank you. He's so long-winded. <laughs> thank you very much, Bruce, um, and thank you all for being here. It's absolutely wonderful to see such a packed room. It's tremendous. I have to make it snappy, so let's get on with it. And victories first. Can't resist them. You'll have heard some of them before. Since a year ago, our movement has won many fantastic victories, and the only reason we have is because people care and they work on them. Ringling Brothers took all the elephants off the road. <laughs> SeaWorld stopped breeding all the orcas. <laughs> NIH ended 50 years of sadistic baby monkey experiments. The Angora rabbit fur market collapsed. <laughs> Various bills passed, making cruelty to animals a felony, banning possession of exotics, banning wild animal acts, and even banning some hideous chemical tests on animals. Michael Hackenberger, the owner of the tiger in the life of Pi, who we caught whipping a tiger up to 19 times, is now facing criminal charges in Canada. And his zoo is closing down. In other entertainment news, the notorious pony carousel in Vienna that's been there for 129 years just closed. And this weekend, the mayor of San, oh, this week, the mayor of San Fermin came out and said, first mayor ever, that he is opposed to the running of the bulls. After showing retailers footage of sheep being punched in the face, suppliers to stores like Balenciaga and Gucci and retailers like Patagonia suspended or ended all purchases of wool. We convinced Pottery Barn, Crate and Barrel, and Williams Sonoma to, produce, to promote synthetic down, saving millions of ducks and geese. Yeah. And World Market and Pier One no longer sell any down at all. When we took unwatchable footage of dogs being clubbed to death in China for leather, and we proved that that skin is exported into this country, some companies stopped selling all leather gloves, and Delsey Luggage, which sells to Macy's and Zappos, agreed not to buy any leather at all anymore. We persuaded 130 international banks and corporations to stop using cruel glue traps, saving millions of rats and mice, who in my opinion are the dearest little angels in the world. <laughs> Tesla now offers its models X and S with a vegan leather interior. Ferrari, Ferrari now offers synthetic leather as an up grade for its new convertible. We got Uber to drop its leather requirement for Uber black cars and Volvo to offer vegan leather interiors in its cars. And when my car imploded, which was not a terrorist act, I bought an all vegan smart car. There it is. It cost about $14,500, but it's a Mercedes. So if anybody tells you the president of Peter drives a Mercedes, they're telling you the truth. <laughs> All these victories and many, many, many more in just the last year alone prevent massive suffering. They remind people that animals count and they change the entire marketplace. Are we happy about these victories? <laughs> Then consider this chilling thought. If we only spent our time and our money fighting factory farming to the exclusion of all else, none 
of the victories I've mentioned would have happened. Yet, at this conference and elsewhere, you will hear people asking us to only concentrate on factory farming work. Great apes would not be coming out of the laboratories now if that had happened if Jane Goodall hadn't spent her years out in the forest convincing us that great apes were just other human beings with another name if she had spent her entire career handing out vegan leaflets. You know, she taught us that chimpanzees share more DNA with us than Anthony Bourdain. <laughs> and I'm all for handing out VSKs, vegetarian leaflets. I do it myself. I support the people who do. But we have to face that there is more work that needs to be done than fighting factory farming. I wanted to talk tonight about who animals are, because that's what I always do, about how bats will bring food to ailing bats and pigeons mate for life and all these other wonderful things that define who animals are. But I have to talk instead about this insidious only work on factory farming issues business. We are a vegan food movement. Of course we are. But we are much, much more than that. We're an animal rights movement. We're not going to wait until everybody eats veggie burgers before we help other animals. That's like in the 60s when white people were told they shouldn't go down to the south to register black voters until all white people were taken care of. Or when we're told you shouldn't work on animal rights until all human rights issues are resolved. That's rubbish. The animal rights movement's goal is to get people to recognize that just as animals are not hamburgers, they're also not handbags. They're not test tubes with whiskers. They're not cheap burglar alarms. They're not props for photo ops. They're not pests. They're individuals. And we must protect all of them, even the animals we're not that familiar with, like that. <laughs> Uh -huh. If I, if we had only worked on factory farming, baboons and pigs would still be slammed into walls in car crash tests. There'd be no faux fur or fake snake, no pleather, no vegan fleece, no alternatives to killing a mouse to see if you're pregnant. But there are. And why? Because our movement made sure those things changed, those things happened. And because we are against speciesism, we know that that means we're against cruelty to cows, to pigs, to chickens, yes. But we're also against cruelty to dogs and cats and rabbits and elephants and monkeys and rats and the rest of them. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is some people who work on factory farm issues, and they're good people, and I love many of them. I think they do great work. They're using these things called evaluation groups to promote this idea that it's only effective to do factory farming work. And to me, that's like Republican redistricting. It's a lot of hooey. <laughs> they say suffering is a question of math. I love math, and their numbers don't add up. They say that since a chicken lives for about 42 days, instead of saving one dog for suffering for a year, you should save nine chickens and forget the dog. Well, imagine that dog, because I work with dogs out in the field all the time. I can. Imagine him chained in a patch of his own waste for one year. These are real dogs that we've helped, shivering through every winter night. Yes, you're with me. I, come on. Shivering through every winter night, scorching in the summer without shade, thirsty, his eyes bitten raw by the flies drawn to his waist. Mange doesn't allow him to sleep. He's always hungry. His backbone protrudes. These are all real dogs like this. What if his collar has eaten into his neck? Is it the same as nine chickens on a factory farm for 42 days? 
Who knows? Animals aren't numbers, they're individuals, vivisectors. <laughs> Vivisectors reduce animals to numbers. We don't. Our movement is against all the ugly things done to any animal. Animal rights people don't celebrate responsible dog-owned breeders, humane meat, organic wool, or sustainable fishing. We do not want to sustain cruelty. We want to end it. <laughs> I love that cartoon. One issue does not a movement make. Our strong, diverse movement reaches into all the dark corners of abuse and pulls the victims out. We're changing the world, not only so that children can eat veggie hot dogs, but so they don't grow up thinking that their parents take them to the circus so it must be acceptable to dominate animals. That's why we've closed down five roadside zoos and circuses in the last year, and with your help, we'll close them all down eventually. Some say the only thing that counts is saving the most lives. But all social justice movements have a far larger goal. We want to stop people from denying basic rights to others simply because they are others. And take gateway issues. Someone appalled that Cecil the lion was shot by a dental tourist and who thinks they only care about that visits our website and bingo, they learn about all the other issues. And they would never have sought them out because they weren't interested. This happens all the time, it's true. Someone heard about an abandoned dog put in a crate covered in plastic left by the road to starve. They were outraged. Peter offered a reward, the perpetrator was caught, we all went to court, there was a demo outside the courthouse. People who cared only about dogs came to the demo, got the whole animal rights banana. And here is Tyran Matthew, I am a huge new big fan, in a little bit of his ad about dogs in hot cars. Bless his heart. that he had to get out of the car. People who like Tyran or who like dogs visited the website to see that video. And when they were there, they saw every other video that we have on the website. Um, things that they had never set out to see. And Tyran, who did this commercial because he loves dogs, went vegan after he did it. <laughs> We opened a pop-up in Asia, a shop where customers who opened exotic bags saw this. This video went viral. Over 50 million people watched it online. If you only worked on factory farming, tough luck for all the reptiles who are killed by having a hose pushed down their throat and their whole bodies expanded with water. False choices are just silly. You know the thing about if you could save only one, which one would you save, the man or the dog? You know, the cartoonist Berkeley Breathed was really wonderful. He said, well, it would depend. Is the man Osama bin Laden and the dog Lassie? Nothing is that cut and dry. Should we stop working to free Nosy, whose gig at the fair we just got cancelled this week? Should we let Lolita rot in her cement tank? Helping them 
has enormous impact for them, but it has impact for a lot of animals going into the future, and it is a milestone for all animals. True story, a lab assistant in New York, he knew a monkey named Clayton. This is not Clayton, it's another monkey coming up here, but same thing. Assistant left, went away. Eight years later, he returned to the lab, and there was Clayton. And it suddenly struck this man that in all the years he'd been gone, Clayton had sat in the same spot. And he wrote this, he said, Clayton had a pink face, he had dark eyes, sandy fur, and a two-inch titanium rod screwed into the top of his skull. Clayton was born in a breeding center, he grew up in a metal box, and he spent his adolescence with a hole in his head and a coil through his eye. He wrote, in 10 or 15 years of life, Clayton suffered multiple surgeries and infections and endless hours of restraint in a plastic chair. He said, I moved across the country, I became a journalist, I married, I went on vacations. But for Clayton, nothing ever changed. Every day or two, he was carted off to a room, his head is fixed in place by a post that still protrudes from his skull. Let's not ignore people like Clayton, for they are people and they need us to liberate them. Statistics are deceptive. Someone said people may go to the circus maybe once a year or to the zoo maybe three or four times in their life, but every time a person chooses to eat vegan, they're saving 200 animals a year. It isn't about how often a human being goes to the circus or the zoo. It's about the animals who are stuck in the circus or the zoo year after year, going insane, turning in circles, biting the bars, trying to cope, whether we go or not. Our job is only to get them out. The same evaluators say, oh, a thousand dollars saves 2.5 dogs or cats versus saving 11,000 food animals. So ignore the dogs and cats. These cows disagree. <laughs> Now, I'll grant you it's more effective to give money to spaying and neuter rather than to placement. As irresistible as placement is, for example, this dog needs a home right now. So if you've got one, let me know. Not a crate in a hoarder's basement, but a real ho home in your house. Now, that didn't take me any time to say, and I'm still vegan. <laughs> but the figures don't add up. On Peter's fleet of mobile spay clinics, in one tiny area, we have sterilized 130,000 dogs and cats. Now, just imagine if only half of those animals had a litter, and it was a small litter, and only half of the animals in that litter ever had a litter, and that was it, no more not offspring, we have saved over 13 million lives from being born with nowhere to go, and that's a real statistic. Theoretically, we can save some 200 animals a year if we don't eat them, but really, it's not as if the chicken industry calls up pork and beef and says, hey guys, just got another vegan, cut production by 200 animals. But we definitely saved that 130,000 dogs and cats and prevented that enormous 3 million lives from being born. And if you think that the most vital thing is to save the lives of animals used for food, you have to support the campaigns to end the use of animals for clothing because all of those animals' bodies become food. The food industries depend on down pillow sales, woolly sweater sales, leather shoe sales to bolster profits. And every time we strike a blow against the skins industry, the meat and the dairy industries take a massive hit. The alligators and the ostriches that are made into Prada and Hermes bags are eaten. 
The dogs bludgeoned for leather are eaten, not here, there. Most racehorses end up as hamburger meat. So we didn't get to this point by only talking about factory farming. As worthy as that is, as wonderful as that is, it is not the only thing. It's been a long and hard road. In 1980, unless you took your own bottle to a co-op in Berkeley, you could only buy one shampoo that wasn't tested on animals. The brand was Nature de France. It was hard to find, it was imported, and it was expensive. Fur wasn't an issue then, it was a status symbol. There was no CGI to replace wild animals in movies, and no one, no one questions scientists. Now we have replacements for everything, from vegan ballet slippers to training models that bleed. We've saved millions of animals from experiments and closed labs like this one. And we bought all the animals out. Over 2,000, over 2,000 companies no longer pour products into animals' eyes and down into their stomachs. So to be told to ignore the suffering of animals in labs makes me angry. And finally, some people are embarrassed by controversial campaigns, and I ask them to look back. People said the lunch counter protests were impolite, and they would set the civil rights movement back a hundred years. Here's ACT UP. Here we are together fighting AIDS tests on animals long ago. ACT UP was fantastic. They stopped traffic. They dressed outrageously to say it's what's inside that counts, all that counts. And they empowered people to be bold. Their motto was never be silent, which is our motto now. Their motto was silence is death, which should be our our motto. Here is James Cromwell failing to be silent. Love the James. We stopped those experiments on cats because we made people uncomfortable. And I bless Direct Action Everywhere and groups like that for what they do. Because all they do is tell people the honest to God's truth. If, if we never challenge people, we just tell them what they already know, when will we ever get to rights? What we need is edgy tactics that create the buzz so that our movement is seen and is heard. Allowing people to remain in their comfort zones allows us to remain in ours. But social movements, as someone just said, aren't about comfort, they're about struggle. And that's what we have to do, struggle for animal rights. We all here have far more than we need. I'm not a big consumer. You can see I'm not a fashionable dresser. Uh, but I'm no monk. So if I buy shoes or I go to a dinner or a movie or I go on vacation, I charge myself an animal tax. It's easy, it feels good, and it does good, and I really recommend it. It's easy as pie. Any of us could have been born a mouse on a glue trap or a child in a slum or a dog, one of the ones we saw there, but we are so lucky that we weren't. And so catch this, I just learned this, anyone who makes $34,000 a year is among the richest 1%. You hear about the 1%? All you have to do, given the world's population and poverty, is make $34,000 and you are in the world's richest 1%. 
So, if we buy a few lattes, let's give the cost of another latte to the animals for any campaign we care about. If you put gas in your car, add a dollar for the animals. If you inherit money, get taxes back, a cash gift, a raise, or a bonus, consider paying the animal tax. We will still be mighty, mighty rich. So to summarize, that's okay. <laughs> I'm no fundraiser. They kick me out of the fundraising meetings. I just spend it. So to summarize, please, let's not hug those who still keep orcas in tiny cages but don't breed them now. Yeah. To me, that's like a man in Philadelphia who kidnapped all those women, kept them in the basement and raped them. What if he stopped raping them, but he still kept them? I mean, would he really be okay then? Let's get the orcas out. Let's bust the myth that there's humane and sustainable anything. Let's ensure that going vegan means wearing vegan, using cruelty-free products, not giving to health charities that test on animals, not being photographed with a parrot on our shoulders, not swimming with dolphins, objecting to all animal objectification, showing the videos to everyone and never shutting up about how worthy animals are and actively, actively working to stop the abuse of all animals. In labs, live plucked, anally electrocuted, cut up in class, beaten in the circus, chained in the backyard, sold in a pet shop, hit in the face with clippers, caught in glue traps, kept in ca cages, hunted, trapped, and torn about apart. Let's be loud, let's be strong, let's be persuasive, let's be determined, let's be unstoppable, and let's be uncomfortable. And next year, more victories, because animal rights will happen if we try, and we try hard. So please, do everything you can possibly think of to do all the time. Thank you very, very much.